Hello friends, welcome to All or None Law Team. This is part two of the video lecture on hepatorenal syndrome. In the beginning, we discussed about the introduction and the pathophysiology of hepatorenal syndrome. Now let's discuss the diagnosis and the management aspect. Precipitating factors for hepatorenal syndrome, bacterial infections, large volume paracentesis, GI bleed, alcoholic acute hepatitis, all leading to renal vasoconstriction and this is the pathophysiology of the hepatorenal syndrome. Precipitating event is identified in up to 70 to up to 100% of the cases. Of bacterial infections, a clear, a clear chronologic and pathogenic relationship is established, especially for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. 25% of the alcoholic hepatitis patients develop HRS and albumin infusion along with antibiotics in patients with SBP reduces the development of HRS. This is based on the study published in New England Journal of Medicine, 1999. So remember, you can prevent HRS in spontaneous bacterial peritonitis by giving albumin. So think about it. There are two types of hepatorenal syndrome. Type 1 is more serious, it's acute and associated with the precipitating event we just talked about. It is defined as at least a two-fold increase in serum creatinine to a level which is greater than 2.5 mg per deciliter during a period of less than two weeks. Type 2 develops insidiously and is seen in more advanced liver disease and ascites. Major clinical feature is that the ascites is resistant to diuretics and it represents slow progression of cirrhosis. What's the incidence of the disease? So one year probability of HRS in cirrhosis patients is about 18% and five year probability is about 40% based on one study in 1993. Another one by Moriu published in Gastroenterology 2002 with, which was a multi-center retrospective study involving little over 400 patients of cirrhosis, ARF was demonstrated and the most common cause was ATN in 35% of the cases and pre-renal azotemia in 32% of the cases. The rest of the cases, 20% and little over 7% were type 1 and type 2 HRS respectively. In another one which was most rec recently published in 2005, Kidney International by Dr. Wong, um, a, which included 102 patients with cirrhosis, again ATN followed by HRS was the most common cause for renal failure. What could be the predicting factors? If you remember, we discussed in the pathophysiology that renal vasoconstriction is the main pathophysiologic mechanism for HRS. So if you do a duplex ultrasound of the kidney and look at the resistive indices and if they are elevated and their normal kidney function, a study which was done by Platt published in Hepatology in 1994 showed that when you look at these patients compared to those who had normal resistive indices and ultrasound, there is more development of HRS in those who had higher resistive indices. But remember, this is a cumbersome study, long study and needs a good technician to do it. So we need some other factors which are easy to measure and still predict HRS. So what could be those? So those include dilutional hyponatremia. So keep it in your mind, dilutional hyponatremia is an independent predictor of HRS based on a multivariate analysis. Low sodium, reduced plasma osmolality, low arterial BP can also predict this. The other tools which are really important as independent predictors are high plasma inactivity and absence of hepatomegaly. Clinically, maybe you demonstrate absence of hepatomegaly, but not very useful. Plasma inactivity, we don't, we don't generally calculate it. However, dilution hyponatremia is commonly evident on any routine blood work that you do. What about the diagnosis? So diagnosis of the HRS um, is uh, defined by the International Ascites Club. Um, there is a major criteria. If you have one major criteria, you are you're done then minor criteria will help you. So what is the major criteria? So low glomerular filtration rate as, as indicated by serum creatinine of more than 1.5 milligrams per deciliter, um, absence of shock or any bacterial infection, fluid loss or concurrent current treatment with any nephrotoxic agents, no um, sustained improvement in renal function after holding diuretics and giving some volume back with plasma expanders and there is no evidence of kidney damage like proteinuria, um, no ultrasonographic evidence of obstructive uropathy or parenchymal renal disease. Additional criteria include low urine volume that is oliguria, low urine sodium. So one of the differential for low urine sodium is HRS. The other ones being contrast nephropathy in the beginning part, pre-renal azotemia and glomerular nephritis as well. Urine osmolality greater than plasma os uh, osmolality, no hematuria and serum sodium concentration is less than 130. Here HRS is diagnosis of exclusion, one major criteria of what we just discussed and in one of the studies when they diagnosed acute renal failure in HRS patients by IAC criteria, only roughly around 60% of the patients qualify for this. 
prognosis uh, type 1 has a very bad prognosis mortality is very high uh, survival efficacy is just only a little over three months in 10 percent of the patients prognosis is particularly poorly in patients with apparent precipitating factors type 2 patients have much better mean survival MELT score and um, MELT score is an important predictor in hepatitis syndrome patients regarding the prognosis and in this study if you see the magic number was 20 those with a MELT score of over 20 had the survival of median survival was only one month compared to those with less than 20 having a median survival of around eight months so survival is very bad with hepatitis syndrome magic number is 20. so management aspects what are the general measures for this type 1 patients can be uh, needs to be hospitalized whereas type 2 patients can be managed in an outpatient you have to place a central venous catheter for intravascular volume status and a guide fluid and albumin infusion diuretics must be stopped tense exercises you tap it by doing therapeutic paracentesis and you give albumin to prevent post circulatory dysfunction uh, exclude other causes of acute renal failure and look for pre precipitating factors especially small uh, um, especially spontaneous bacterial peritonitis um, there are four major therapeutic interventions for hrs treatment pharmacological treatment which includes renal vasodilators like dopamine phenaldepam prostaglandins and seralcin these are not used systemic vasoconstrictors like vasopressin and locks ornipressin not used but terlipressin yes proven by trials Somatostatin analogs like octreotide, yes. Alpha adrenergic agonists, midodrine, norepinephrine, yes. Tips can be done. Renal replacement therapy will quickly touch on and liver transplantation as well. So this is a study which is looking at the trilipressin and albumin, um, a, which showed a significant improvement in the GFR, increased arterial pressure, and reduction in the serum creatinine. Survival improvement seen, but no control group in these studies, and that was the lacking factor in this study. All the trials used trilipressin until the serum creatinine decreased to less than 1.5, or for a maximum of 15 days, because by then they have to get for liver transplant. Otherwise, they will be dead because of the bad prognosis. Non-epinephrine with albumin in the ICU settings is the most appropriate therapy because terlipressin is not available at in some of the places like in United States it's not appear uh, not uh, available whereas in Canada and uh, in Europe it's available head to head studies comparing the norepinephrine plus albumin versus terlipressin plus albumin have showed no difference so norepinephrine is a lot cheaper to do compared to terlipressin if you do monotherapy with midodrine it's not going to use it's not going to help if you do a therapy with octreotide plus albumin, again, it's not going to help. The only thing that's going to help, if not norepinephrine with albumin, is mirrodrine octreotide with albumin. This can be done on a floor. In the ICU level, you do norepinephrine with albumin. On the floors, you can do mirrodrine octreotide with albumin. Tips, helps, and based on this study, where you insert uh, um, through the transjugular vein, you come in, you pass the guide wire, enter the hepatic vein, then you blow a sh uh, stent and create a shunt. This is a study which is showing the beneficial effects of the tip in patients with hepatorenal syndrome. Published in Hepatology Journal in 1998. What about renal replacement therapy? Again, prognosis is very bad. So before putting these patients on any sort of renal replacement therapy, discuss the mortality and morbidity associated with the HRS with the patient and with the uh, gastroenterology attendings because if there is no option for liver transplant if the patient is not a candidate for liver transplant and if there is a prediction that the liver function is chronically um, disabled and it's not going to return then there is no point in doing any sort of renal replacement therapy because of the high morbidity and mortality stump studies have shown prolonged survival uh, with renal replacement therapy but at the cost of increased morbidity and hospital stay there is no benefit of intermittent versus continuous renal replacement therapy there is a new technique which is coming up but still not available needs more evaluation which is called as mars that is molecular adsorbent recirculating system it is nothing but dialysis for the liver it removes both albumin bound and water soluble substances by combination of albumin enriched dialysate and CRRT. It's based on the assumption that removing albumin bound toxins like bile acids, which have a detrimental effect on hepatocytes and other organs, will stabilize the liver function and other organ damage. It also removes some cytokines, nitric oxide, which are implicated in HRS. But still, this is investigation, so something new to learn. Liver transplantation is an independent, so renal function is an independent predictor of both short term and long term post transplantation survival and graft survival. After transplant, renal failure will persist for up to six weeks. 
post transplant reversal for HR is only about 60%. Duration of the dialysis before to deliver transplant did not have impact on the renal recovery. Current allocation system in US is based on the MELD score. Remember 20, less than 20, better survival, more than 20, bad survival. So you will not be doing anything, you will just do comfort measures. Now based on another study which was published in liver transplantation um, in 2005, the impact of the pre-transplant renal failure, only those with permanent renal failure should receive kidney and liver transplantation together. HRS in itself is not an indication for kidney transplantation unless prolonged and severe. HRS should be treated at presentation to try to limit renal injury. Thank you so much for watching our video. Please subscribe to our channel All or None Law on YouTube. Keep watching our video.